So here we are three months after Joan Adams gave her judgment on April the 21st, 2017. And probably you can see I'm a lot happier, more relaxed and feeling like life's not so bad after all. So it's been a wonderful period of the three months thinking about what happened and working very hard on a book that we are releasing in November. So Marika Sporos and I have written the book called Nutrition on Trial and it'll be in the bookshops on, in November. And it's, it's a really brilliant book written about everything that's happened to me over the last five years and including everything about the trial and what the outcomes were. So what were the outcomes? Well, the answer was that Joan Adams and her committee ruled 10-0 in my favor. So all her judgments, we won. There was one dissenting voice in the committee of five, but he really didn't present anything that would cause us concern. Unfortunately, the HPCSA has decided to appeal the decision, which is quite interesting because, of course, the HPCSA set up the committee originally, and now they get a chance to have a second committee, which they will establish. And one wonders how independent that group is going to be. Here we had 26 days of a trial and the decision was made and it was very clear what the outcome was. And now we're honestly going to believe that another set of five people is going to come to a different decision. And if they do come to a different decision, were they utterly, completely independent? Because we know from the first trial that the HPCSA tried to have two more people on the committee that would bias the decision. But let's look at what was achieved and what wasn't achieved by the Health Professional Council. To make the case against me stick, they had to prove that there was a doctor-patient relationship. And there clearly never was. Uh, you simply cannot expect there to be a doctor-patient relation because one person answers a Twitter question. Most importantly, the question was a we question. It was for moms and babies. It wasn't for I. And the HBCSA never determined that that person was in fact a mother and that she was breastfeeding. So they had no case. It's really interesting that there's now an article in the South African Medical Journal written by a Dr. Kubecha, who is a person involved in ethics and public relations at the University of Witwatersrand. And she says that doctors have a responsibility to answer we questions on Twitter, but they should avoid answering I questions. So she actually was saying that I did exactly as you'd expect. I answered a we question, which is what you'd expect a person of my caliber who's honest and genuine, that if someone asks me a question, I'll have the decency to answer it. So that's the first point. There was never a doctor-patient relationship and there can't be a doctor-patient relationship on Twitter. People don't write on Twitter and say, Dear Dr. Noakes, can I have a doctor-patient relationship with you? And here's my question. They ask a question because they want to go back to their doctor with more information so that they can ask the doctor to treat them in this way or in that way. And that's how Twitter works. And everyone would agree that. If... Mrs. Leinstraw wanted my, a doctor's opinion and to set up a doctor-patient relationship with me. She would have said, Dr. Noakes, I really need your advice because you're an author of The Real Meal Revolution. How can I contact you? What's your email address? And then we might well have developed a doctor-patient relationship. But Twitter is, can never be a doctor-patient relationship. So the HPCSA never established that. And in their appeal, they're not going to be able to establish it. So it's pointless to have the appeal, in my opinion. The second point they had to establish was that the advice I gave was unconventional. But it wasn't unconventional because exactly what the South African Dietary Guidelines are. They say you must wean onto real foods. And they listed the real foods exactly as if they'd come straight out of the Real Meal Revolution and the Green Page. So they were never able to establish that what I'd done was unconventional. So on the basis of that, I can't see how a appeal is going to make any difference to anyone. What is the risk of the appeal? And this is the important point because we haven't yet discussed 
my constitutional rights, which were infringed all the way through the trial. But what is my constitutional right as a medical doctor and freedom of speech? I should have the right to say what I like in public. Now, if it turns out that the appeal goes against me and I lose the case, that has huge implications because what it means, it means that no doctor in future in South Africa will ever be able to answer a wee question, whether it be on email or on Twitter or any in the public, or perhaps even in a written document like a book. So for example, technically, uh, if I lose the case, a doctor could not answer this question even in a book. Dear Dr. Noakes, should I stretch before I run the Two Oceans Marathon? Or dear Dr. Noakes, should I, eat, should I sleep six hours a night? And the answer, you can't answer that question because that's medical advice and the Health Professional Council has decided that doctors may not give out medical advice that potentially could cause harm if you don't examine the patient. And that's what they're driving for. So if the case against me is won by the Health Professional Council, no doctor in South Africa will be able to say anything in public, absolutely nothing, so that your position as a doctor prevents you from having freedom of speech. Now, is that what this country wants? Is that what the Constitution protects or not? And the answer is, of course, it's not what the Constitution wants. And doctors should be allowed to say what they want to, to answer we questions. They should be encouraged to provide information to the public. And on the basis of all that information, the public can, can then decide what they do with that information. I think the point is that medicine has to grow up and realize that social media is a, is a fact of life. And as I wrote in a letter to the South African Medical Journal about the case and about how you can use Twitter, how doctors can use Twitter, I said that doctors got to wake up and realize that social media is the, the way that the future that people will get their medical information. And we have to become very savvy in the way we use it. The problem is that doctors may be reluctant to agree that in future patients will get their medical information not simply from their own doctor as part of a doctor-patient relationship. They will get it increasingly from going on social media and watching things like these, these videos that, that Glenn has kindly put out. And they will then go back to the doctor and say, but listen doctor, I got this information from Twitter or from social media, what do you think about it? And doctors have two choices. They can either say, you only get information from me, or say, gosh, let's discuss it. And the latter is the only way that we are going to survive as a profession. We have to realize the old days of the anointed, where we will become professors, and we have the whole truth, are gone. They are gone. We now have the wisdom of the crowds. And that's the beauty of Twitter, is that there are so many experts out there that if I or anyone else tweets something that is wrong, someone will jump in and say you're wrong and we'll all advance our knowledge. So it's been a, a tough five or six years, but my wife and I are glad that it turned out the way it has. We're eternally grateful to all the great people who helped us on our trial, the lawyers who were just astonishing, all the people who supported us. But really importantly, the general public, because we always knew that what we were doing was correct. And the feedback from the general public was astonishing. And my wife and I would like to thank them, and particularly the Banting Seven Day Meal Plan Facebook page, the 800,000 people on that Facebook page who have, whose lives have been changed and who've really taught us that this Banting movement is the, it's the movement of the future that people are taking back their health. And unless we as doctors appreciate that people will decide what to do on the basis of the evidence that they have, and they will no longer be just simply told by us what to do, when we realize that, we're going to make the, the world a much healthier place. So thanks for your attention and interest in this series. I hope that it will continue to change the world and that eventually we will one day realize that what we put into our mouths is the ultimate determinant of our health.